questions. Hi, Jimmy. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Rachel. Great to be interviewed. It's uh, great to speak again. It is. It's always good to have a chat with you, Jimmy. Um, so we're going to have a talk today about stress management and what that actually means, because mm -hmm. um, obviously people know what stress is, but then how to the, the management side of it. There are so many different ways of, of, of doing that out there. Um, can you sort of condense it a little bit so that you can help people? Yeah, understand. absolutely. Absolutely. And there are a number of ways, absolutely, depending on what your area expertise is. So, you know, um, different people find different things work for them. I don't think there's a model that's panacea that works for everybody. It's about finding what works for you. Um, but obviously, stress is, is normal. It's normal to be stressed. One of the ways I look at things is I look at things from an evolutionary perspective. So we look at the evolution of the nervous system. And if we go back to thousands if not millions of years ago um, in the very beginning when you think people would walk around the earth and roam around the earth with all these sort of dangerous animals and predators and prey mm. and the way we'd react to um to, to predators and prey would be fight flight or freeze so for example you're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger you're either going to stop and fight mm. um, you're going to run more life to run in my case, yes. you're going to free, freeze. Um, now we don't have that. We don't have these sort of dangerous species roaming the earth in the modern world. What we do have is a society that we live in, a world we live in mm. that is not conducive to the primal brain. And when I say it's not conducive to the primal brain, where what can happen is we become hypervigilant mm. and hypervigilance is, for example, you know, you, you're driving on a motorway and just to use an analogy, metaphorically speaking, and you're sort of focusing on the road and you're focusing just enough to listen to some music, um, to be aware, to be calm. But equally, you know, if you've experienced or you may not have experienced some sort of situation um, on the road, um, we can be prone to maybe road rage or we start to become hyper alert and start watching the traffic. And it all depends on the traffic too. But the point I'm making here is that we live in a world that we become in one respect, hyper vigilant. We don't have the predator prey scenario, but we do have the brain reacts in the same way to the modern day threats. And the modern day threats could be anywhere from a bill to pay, losing a job because, it's not just about losing a job. It's about if I lose my job, what's going to happen? Can I mm. pay my bills? Will I end up in the street? Can I do this, that, and the other? And we live in that sort of land of what if. Yes, and that sort true. of goes, you know, throughout the day. Um, we sort of are faced with all these situations. If you watch TV, um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world, a lot of polarization. Mm. And there's a stressful world that we live in and that's not just confined to western society obviously it's you know pretty much different place got the different uh things that are going on but the point being is the brain can't differentiate between you know the the, the predators of prey of all those years ago to the modern day society we live in now i'm not saying it's a good or bad thing it is what it is and for me it is about managing that sort of primal brain in the sense that it doesn't run us if that makes sense, where we mm. run our brain rather than our brain sort of run us. And what can happen in certain situations if we don't manage it, where we do become hypervigilant, we do become hyper alert. We are prone to this neurobiological stress response, which runs parallel to anxiety mm. in one sense. And anxiety has got many pathways, by the way. It could be biological, it could be an organic disorder, it could be thyroid, it could be something that needs treated by a medical professional. But it can also be psychosocial, our appraisal of situations. It could be, for example, you know, can I pay the bills? We hypothesize about a situation that may never arise anyway. So for me, mindfulness is really effective at helping people to be more in the moment. The only moment you truly have is the now. True. And, and, and sort of teaching people through practice, it doesn't sort of come easy. People sort of expect to do one meditation and, and that's the end of that. <laughs> it's through practice and sort of working on our default uh, program because some people 
you know, we know in our genes environment, our genes interact with our environment and they influence our behavior. Uh, but the point being is that irrespective of our gene or experiences in the past, we can start with where we are and, and we can sort of move forward. We can work on things like appraisal. We can work on things on just being okay with our emotions and feelings. For example, if you sort of stub your toe or you hit your funny bone, um, <laughs> precisely, yes. but it's going to pass, isn't it? Yes. This too shall pass. And same as an emotion. So in the world we live in, Rachel, what we've sort of done with emotions is that an example I use is that if we look at, say, schools, for example, it's not having it at schools or teachers. I've been one myself and I'm lecturing myself. Let's say, for example, the young child says to the parent on the first day of school, I've got a tummy ache. Mm -hmm. Now, that could be the child might be thinking, I'll say that because I want a day off school or I don't want to go in. But it could equally be feeling anxious. Yeah. The child could be anxious. And how often does a parent say to the child, I, you know, not necessarily in the words, you're feeling anxious, but how do you feel? The teacher, how do you feel? It's almost like, okay, dismissing as they want the day off. And they could generally be anxious because the mind and body is one system. Yes, absolutely. Okay? It is one system. And what happens is it manifests somatically. So sometimes, for example, if we're stressed, we might have a cold sore, we get hives, and we know that. So equally anxiety can manifest itself too, but this too shall pass. So rather than for me, it's about recognizing the emotion. So whatever the emotion might be is rather than suppressing it, because we know there's a lot of evidence around suppression. Mm -hmm. You know, Freud said all those years ago, suppression wasn't good and he was right. In the He's sense that right. if, you suppress, if you suppress an emotion, it's like a fizzy pop, you shake it, what happens? When you it open explodes it. everywhere. Precisely. So for me, the analogy is, if I take this paper like that, and I rip one piece, you probably won't notice. If I keep ripping away, what do you get on the floor? A mess. Precisely. <laughs> and most people, Rachel, and for our viewers, what they do is, at the point of when they do start to intervene and get help, it's the mess. Yeah. So getting there early as possible. So in the brain... You know, if you leave bad food in the fridge, what happens to the other food? Oh, it all goes contaminated, Precisely. yes. So yes. the earlier you can get to someone, the better it is. And I'm not implying that they see me or anybody else for that. You know, everyone's different and everyone's going for their own thing. Mm. But equally, seeing the GP, seeing a clinician, if that's the way they want to go around doing things, is a good place to start. You know, where I come in is if it's appropriate and applicable to work with me, then I use my expertise, which, you know, generally speaking is um, hypnosis, but I also do many other modalities too. Mm. That gives you a bit of an insight really into sort of how we can start to manage. Um, so we recognize the emotion in advert to suppressing it. We accept it's there. And when I say acceptance, people say, what do you think the first reaction I get when I say acceptance, Rachel? What do you think people think when I say accept? I don't want to accept it. I don't want Precisely. it there. Precisely. And that's even more resistance mm. because you're battling against millions of years of evolution. You know, from the very beginning, you know, when you go to a pond and you sort of clap your hands and there's little tadpoles going one way or the other. So mm -hmm. you start in the beginning, we're a very simple organism. We then develop a spine reflex. If I throw a ball towards, you're going to catch it. Mm. Okay. And then you develop a hyperfile, a brainstem where the brainstem is instrumental in, you don't tell yourself to breathe, but you do it automatically. Yeah. A hypothalamus, motivation. You know when you're hungry, you know when you're first, you know uh, functions, you know um, from, from the point of view, um, the hypothalamus, motivational behavior. Not motivation to watch the video, for example, motivation in the sense that, you know, when we're hungry, uh, you know, reproduction, all these sort of things to keep the species alive. Then we build upon that, we have what we call uh, a limbic system, uh, so the emotional sense of the brain. And, and then beyond that, we start to have the modern structures, the, the neocortex. Now, you know, that's sort of a few, that's in simplicity, mm. that's millions of years of evolution. Um, you know, in, in, in a minute or so, people can watch videos I've done on this in the, you know, on YouTube if they want to, it goes through it in more detail, I'll send them an email. Yeah. But the point being is that, you know, our primal brain is very influential in how we feel. And I think for me, 
trying to change that with our more modern brain is a big challenge. So we can develop a more model brain, the one that's sort of more conscious, the one that sort of tells us, for example, if you're walking down the street, we're not in any imminent danger. So for example, the example I use, if, if you were sitting down on a park bench and someone's walking towards you mm. very quickly, what would your first reaction be, do you think? Well, it depends who you are. Some people would smile. Some people would Precisely. shy away. Precisely. And, and let's say, for example, they, 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 they sort of were sort of pointing towards you. One's first reaction might be danger. Mm. Or it might be, well, they might be, who knows. But as they walk towards you, you sort of, this sort of tennis match between the, the more modern brain, well, they might be telling me something. And the primal brain, I might be in danger. So you're getting ready to fight, flight, or freeze. But yeah. the point being is that until you realize what they're saying is you've dropped your wallet. And then yeah. the two brains, it, you know, the primal and modern brain, you know, then think, well, actually, you know what? You settle. But the cortisol and the neurobiological response has already happened. It's already, so it's already happened, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, could, it could, the cortisol, it, you know, that response has, has happened. The wheels are in motion. I'm not going to go into the science behind it. Um, because of time, but the point being is that it's the same response, you know, and anxiety, the threat's not real, fear is real. So it's real to the person, anxiety, it's not undermining it, but it's a land of what if. Mm -hmm. What if they're coming to attack me? What if they're coming towards me? Okay, where fear, if someone's running after you, like, you know, if a wild dog is coming after you, it's a real response. Yeah. So the differential is anxiety being that sort of hypothesized response, the imagination, if the boss sends you an email and there's redundancies going on, you sort of has to check that, you wonder yeah. what could it be if your friend walks straight past you and they don't say hello and you had a bit of a fallout a week before and you wonder that they've fallen out. So you can reappraise these situations and think, well, actually, you know what? The boss has got to email everybody. Yeah. The person may not have seen you. Um, and that's the sort of key. But the, these sort of, the primal brain and, and modern brain don't always gel well together in that sense. And genetically, our upbringing, our experience, they all have an effect. There's not really one thing in terms of our brain development. That mm. first year, by the way, is imperative in brain development. A lot of neurons mm. are formed. Yeah. And there's a lot of research done, animal studies, to suggest that if, for example, in that first year, and there was that famous study, that research around the, the rats, um, yeah. and, and some of them were in a loving environment and some of them were in a non-loving environment. And what the, the rats do in that first week, the maternal rat, they, they lick the, um, the baby, and that's the way to express affection. And they sort of show, and they stumble across an experiment. And even many years after, Rachel, the ones who were paired with the licking rats were less anxious and less aggressive mm -hmm. than the ones that... Uh, weren't licked. Yeah. And if you sort of translate to human beings, is that if you're lucky enough to be born into a nice family um, where you've got love and nurture and food and, and, and everything that goes with it, you've got a far better chance um, than someone who hasn't, but equally your genes are, are imminent too. So it's multifactorial. And the point I'm making here is that, you know, the point being is that the, you, when we say acceptance, it's not accepting resignation is that your, your body's doing what the body is meant to do the yeah. brain's meant to do it's so acknowledging that that you are actually absolutely. having that feeling isn't it rather absolutely. than denying it. because that once we accept it's easier for it to release isn't it and then the next thing we do is investigate we can sort of investigate what's going on and i want to see and i'd like to see um this happen more at school with young people, um, trained professionals, giving mm. more of an insight into, okay, the child says, I've got a sore tummy, I'm not feeling good, I'm not coming into school. There's a very good chance they could, they might want a day off, but yeah. equally, there's a very good chance too. And the earlier you work with people, the one thing we can all agree is a lot of evidence, the earlier you work with someone, the better chance they've got. Absolutely. Uh, in terms of precisely. So the point being is that, it's not asking for too much, I think, in my infinite wisdom to introduce skills, psychosocial skills um, in schools because anxiety 
um, and, 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 and depression. And I'm not a clinical expert in depression, by the way, uh, or anxiety, but I do understand the mechanics of it based mm. on my studies in, in, in psychology. Uh, they're on the rise. And that's not mm. just obviously down to one thing, but the point being is that there's a lot of evidence around psychosocial techniques working um, yeah. and different things work for different people. So the point I'm making here is that then you investigate it and you say, well, what's going on? And, you know, what's happening? How come am I feeling this way? Um, and, and sort of owning our emotions. And it's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel anxious. It's okay to feel frustrated. There's but nothing I, think, I, think that's, I think that's a really interesting point because yeah. there's so much pressure on everybody to be, yeah. uh, you know, going forward with everything that is positive in their life. That actually yes. when, those, when those negative emotions or just emotions really are still there, we have to acknowledge that that is part of us, don't we? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And, 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 I, I and, know. And the brain, yeah. And the brain's working well. And the brain's right. doing what the brain should do. If it becomes uncomfortable, then obviously, uh, and it's affecting us in a maladaptive way. And we're not going out of the house. And we're not going shopping. We're not socializing. We're living in, in, in uh, fear. Mm. And that becomes calcified. Then it becomes a problem. If it's, for example, I feel a bit nervous because I'm doing a presentation. I feel a bit nervous doing an interview. I'm on radio and doing a, you know, a, a, an interview on radio and I know a lot of people listening to it. If I'm doing something like an event, then it's okay to feel a bit jittery. The, the point being is that it's when you don't do it because you feel that way. Yes. It becomes maladaptive. And that's the sort of key, the fine line between recognizing it. And we're going to investigate it. And from a hypnosis point of view, you can dissociate from it. You look at ways to dissociate from the experience because it's when we associate something that we are uncomfortable. And the example I use, let's say, for example, you, you, you went abroad and you went in the country you've never been before. You lost your wallet, your passport. How would you feel if you were in a country that you couldn't speak the language? I'd be terrified. Precise, and that's normal <laughs> to feel that way. Yeah. But equally, if you're in a, an environment where you, you spoke the language, the people you knew, you're in your hometown, and you knew people, would you feel more comfortable? You know? Yes, because you'd know where to go. Yeah, you'd you'd, 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 have, that, you'd yes. have that map, yes. wouldn't the you, map, to be the, able the to brain, follow. The brain likes familiarity. So one of the points of hypnosis is, is dissociating from what is prompting the feeling and connecting to a more resourceful feeling. A bit like when I did the, the BBC radio, the program with Margaret, who was looking at the reduced weight many years ago. And one of the ways around it, I felt if you go back swimming again, it'd have a massive knock-on effect, mm. a social strategy. If you go swimming, she can, you know, she's retired, she's looking to lose, reduce in weight, she's in the 60s, mm. and she's not socializing. And, and I felt a social technique that would work really well would be swimming because she's swimming, she's got her friends. If she's with her friends, she's swimming, she's obviously not eating. Yeah. Um, and the point being is she's sort of feeling better about herself. She's less likely to emotionally eat. And that was the rationale behind that. Mm. And but she had this sort of fear of swimming since she was eight year old. She had an instant in the pool. Um, so what was she associating with, do you think, when she was looking to go swimming? The incident that happened all those years ago. Yeah. So the idea is to reassociate and reconnect with the positive of going and disconnect from the negative. And that's, I did regression with her, timeline amongst a few other things. And, you know, within a couple of sessions, and I'm not suggesting everyone one or two sessions is going to work for everybody. Yeah. Um, it's all different for everybody, but the transcripts there, people can listen to it. Um, and the point being is that she would go swimming, but and that has a massive knock on effect. She booked a holiday in Spain for the first time. She started socializing. That was the rationale behind that. But the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, investigating the fear she's got and rationalizing, it's normal to feel afraid based on what happened, the schema. Uh, but now all we can do is reappraise it and also disconnect from this empowerment happened a long time ago. You know, the thing is, Rachel, what I say to people is sometimes things happen a long, long time ago. And you see sometimes people look for salvation in other people. Yes. And what I mean by that is that what they didn't receive as a child from the parents, or they think they should have got from the parents, the siblings, um, you know, don't get me wrong, people do the best they can what they've got. And you see sometimes people look for what they didn't get as a young person, the love they think they should have got uh, and look for it in other people. And, 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 and for me, 
you know, the balance of relationship or any relationship, whatever that might be, is reciprocation. Yes. If one is looking for someone else to provide what they didn't think they should have received as a young person, then what ends up happening, the analogy I use, it's a little bit like, say, um, if I wasn't given enough food as a young person, if I go to all you can eat every day, is that going to make up for lost time? <laughs> I can't go back. Mm. and feed the young person I was then mm. all that's going to happen is I'm going to detriment myself now yeah. because you know but what I can do is eat the right food nutrition food and that can help me mm. um, where I am now and obviously depending on the person what they experience you know some people experience you know very challenging upbringings yeah for sure get you know the treatment that you require see a mental health professional um, so for some people it's, it, it takes time and I, I think that's a really yeah. important point as well, Jimmy, because, you know, we, have, we all have this logic, don't we, which yeah. we, we apply to everything. So we, we know what we should be doing. We know. Exactly. And we've tried, but we keep going back, don't we? We keep yo-yoing but, back well, to that old precisely. pattern of behaviour. So something like, the, the that's right, part. so something like hypnosis, yeah. it's that interruption, isn't it, of... Yeah. The, the idea, way that we used to do something yeah, and then the being idea, in that relaxed the state. Yeah. The behavior at the unconscious level. So the example I use sometimes is the, if you take a teenager, they might see a film star smoking. They might see their cool uncle driving a, a Ferrari smoking. They might see, you know, um, someone who's sort of smoking is really cool. Then they have an idea uh, and the idea manifests into a, an association than a behavior and equally the person telling the young person don't smoke then you know you know if you speak to a teenager if a parent tells a teenager the error of their way they're hardly going to say gee thanks mom or dad you're so intellectual you know that is so true i've got three precisely. of them <laughs> Pre precisely but the point being an experience could change them and you know you could sort of say I'm not suggesting one does this, by the way, because, you know, I'm just using an example. If they go visit emphysema ward and see the potential effects of smoking and see smoking is not very cool, mm. you know, the much bigger chance you've got of, of, of lung disease, not that I'm a medical person, but, you know, there's enough evidence out there if they read, then they might have a new idea about smoking, being very uncool, and you have a new behavior. So for me, you interrupt that pattern and then you can promote with ideas they might make use of one idea and suggestion in hypnosis is really, really powerful. Mm. Absolutely. So for me, it's about investigating the emotion. What's it telling me? Um, why am I overeating? And that could be I'm eating in huge quantities because I feel lonely. Um, might be emotionally mm. eating. Um, okay. We dig a bit deeper. Talk to emotion. Um, and I know that might seem a bit strange for some people, but communicate with ourselves and what's it telling me how come am i feeling anxious how come am i frustrated mm. how come am i angry what's going on and sort of get a clearer view logically and we can push things to the logical brain and sort of deal with the emotional brain through creating experiences for people and work on both levels we can look at things in a new way well the person walked past me in the street because they might've been preoccupied. The boss sent me an email because they might've been emailing everybody else um, and so on and so forth. Now it mm. might be the person walks past you and they don't want to speak to you, but you're not in control of what they do. So yeah. you take control of the controls. I can't control what's going on in the world today. And there's a lot of polarization in the world today, irrespective of which way you see the world, there's, uncertainty but in saying that like i said to someone a few days ago as much as all the things that are going on in the world today and we sort of watch the news and 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 so on and so forth we're living debatably in the best ever conditions ever mm -hmm. because i don't see anybody uh, or many people like a hundred years ago working in coal mines for 12 15 hours a day mm. you know there's not many people who are having to sort of, you know, fight on the beaches of Normandy as yeah. a 17-year-old. There's not many people who are living by rations, 
okay? People can afford to go and buy their little Starbucks coffees and mocha lattes. Yeah, and exactly. Internet. You know, these are in very yeah. many ways a golden age in a way, isn't Precisely. it? And I, but so, I think that's also what people are also quite well, afraid of, isn't it? But, but one must put it into perspective and, you yes. know, all we've got is what we've got in front of us. And, and the point being, yeah, we are afraid that could be taken away. And there are issues that need to be resolved, but there are no simple solutions for complex problems. And if we can sort of put things to the table and talk things through uh, and, and, and leadership, that's one way of managing things and saying, okay, there are issues that need resolving. Some things I can't control. Some things I can't control. Some things I can't influence. But the best way to influence, Rachel, is to do by example. Yeah. So one of the things I say to people, uh, and I tell parents sometimes, you know, who beat themselves up, is I tell them that, you know, if you read the, the research, um, at a certain age, the children are more influenced by their social group yes. than, than the parents. So, and genetic, genetic influences the, the child too. You know, sometimes it's what, you know, there's a, a lineage, just like physiological eye color, hair color, mm. you know, same as behavior. So, yes, the parents influence you to a point, um, but there's many other factors and variables too. But the point being is that, if I grab a cigarette and start smoking in front of my kid and I tell them not to smoke, what do you think they're going to do? <laughs> take no notice. <laughs> Precisely. So they might not take notice anyway if I don't, uh, but equally the best chance I've got is to leave um, and sort of be, and that's not just from a children perspective point of view, that's generally speaking. Now, I've said before, there's many variables, okay, um, but leadership, for me, is you going to that place you want people to go first, yeah. if that's possible. And being open to your own flaws. None of us are perfect, okay? Enough. And the therapists all too often and coaches burn out because they beat themselves up. They try and put this image about mm. themselves, you know, and we see it. I've been in this field for many, many years, as you know, yeah. and I can guarantee you now, um, you know, some of the best people in the field are ones who've been through things themselves. Yes. Because they can walk the talk. And there's no shame in, 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 in saying, you know what, um, I've had my experiences. Well, I always tell therapists and coaches. Because the point being is that for me, um, it's, it's keeping it real. You know, and sometimes we experience certain things. And for, it's through our experience, we have introspection. Yeah. And I see many coaches and therapists um, burn out because they try and maintain this facade, um, you know, and not fooling anybody. Yeah. Because the bottom line is, you're a human being. Human and that's being. It. And it doesn't matter what. And it doesn't matter yeah. what stage yeah. we're all at. You know, these emotions so all, come up at different all, stages in our lives, don't they? There's no know, real pattern. We all we all mess up at times. Yeah. You know, we all make mistakes. We all do things that we sort of look back on and think, well, yeah, if I could have done differently. We all we don't start on a level playing field. Some of us, you know, inherit different genes. Some of us inherit, you know, uh, have different parents. Mm -hmm. We didn't choose our parents. You're born into an environment you didn't choose. You didn't choose the genes. But you do the best you can what you've got. It's not a level playing field. Life isn't damn fair, you know, um, because how do you explain someone who gets a condition very young in life? It's, it's heartbreaking when you sort of mm -hmm. see young children who uh, are, are real um, it, it, you know, it really is. And, you know, you don't choose a lot of things in life, but what you can choose is what you do now with what you've got, yeah. you know? Um, and sometimes people can be the victim. They think other people got great lives and other people have all the luck. And I'm here to tell people that from an existential point of view, find meaning in your life. You know, yeah. people try and set themselves these big grandiose goals of being this sort of, you know, all these things. And I think social media plays a part because it's put us in touch with these big mega stars who are only like 0.1% of the population. It's yeah. not just good enough being a footballer. You've got to be the top 0.1%. It's not just good enough being a coach. You've got to be this sort of, you know, and for me setting goals of being a, you know, good working person Realistic. in society, yeah. being a pillar, setting yourself these goals. I'll tell people set, set marginal goals, you know, learning something new, um, being the sort of person people can rely on, being the sort of person that can sort of, you know, stand strong in times of adversity, but he's not afraid to have a wobble too. And then those sort of things for me, 
I told people, set yourself goals that are manageable, incremental, but get meaning in your life. You know, yeah. and that's the big thing. And that's the sort of big thing that for me, the existential is about if you find meaning in your life, you get up in the morning and even when the chips are down, even when things feel like, you know, you can't be doing right for doing wrong. It feels like it's coming at you from every angle. Well, on those days, you know, well, you've got that anchor yeah. when you've got that meaning in your life, you've found something to anchor you down safely, securely, because you believe in it so passionately, really, Absolutely. isn't it? And, and, and that, so that brings us, and that's it, the flexibility. And have, have so have that, the flexibility to change if, you know, people set these 10 year goals and I do too, but every six months I suggest to reevaluate the goal because if it becomes a chore and obsession and you're doing it because you just, are afraid that you know what if i don't see it through mm. if after six months you're working on something and you know what you say to yourself you know what it's not for me then okay i'm not suggesting to walk away from things what i'm suggesting is that if it becomes a chore or an obsession then you've got to sort of reevaluate and think well actually you know what it's a fine line race with a goal getting up in the morning every now and again at three o'clock and thinking you know is this for me but it's okay once every now and again, but if that's happening continuously, then you got to think, well, actually, you know what? Um, is this for me? And that's the sort of big thing I sort of say to people from a goal point of view, you know, think our values change, life changes. And, you yeah, know, and I think that's what people yeah. do really struggle with, Jimmy, the change, isn't it? Because yeah. we, we don't forget we've been brought up in, a, in, in, you know, many of, many of us have been brought up with, a structure a structure to what we should be aiming for in life and we, uh, we, great point. we believe on we believe very much what that structure should be until it doesn't resonate with us until Precise. it doesn't fit here, in with your heart here yeah, uh, yeah, but exactly. finding that resilience yeah. which again yes. comes back to that stress management yeah. because otherwise when we get stressed we, we don't have that anchor that resilience yeah. to sort of well, well, ride back manage, for it yeah, exactly when you when you don't manage the stress um, eventually it's going to catch up and, and stress pathologically is not good. You know, don't have to take my words for it. The listeners, the, the viewers, they can read the research. Well, the figures are out there, aren't they? Precisely. You know, stress it's, what, is it 80%, is it? Yes, it? but also stress pathologically has been linked as a variable to many conditions, mm. many, many conditions. Now, I'm not a medical expert, but as you all know, I studied psychology and, and I studied neuroscience. Stress is linked to many pathologies it really is you know that sort of chronic when you turn that tap on it's okay to, to turn the tap on and turn it off but if you blast that tap on and it's always going all the time it's linked to a lot of pathologies it's not good for your brain it's mm -hmm. not good for any of the organs you know stress to a point is okay but if you're chronically stressed and you're always in that fight flight freeze mode yeah. survival mode then it's got severe pathological consequences it really has and you know it's like for example the i mentioned earlier about you know to be able to switch that off so if the person's running towards me and my brain is in agreement i'm safe now they're just telling me my wallet's on the floor now where that becomes pathological is if that's always ongoing if i can't get out of my head if i go yes. home yeah. and i wake up then we sort of start to look at the post-traumatic stress um, now, post-traumatic stress, for me, in my opinion, is controversial. Um, now, I'm not sort of uh, implying I'm an expert in the area, but I, my understanding of it, and one of the things I want to sort of put forward, um, and if there's anyone watching who is a clinical expert, it'd be nice to see your thoughts. You know, what I find controversial is that, um, you know, how do we define it? Because, you know, someone could go and fight in a war and, and succumb to, you know, someone blowing up next to them or, or be involved in an explosion and that can obviously can you mm -hmm. know traumatize but equally someone who's domestic violence over many years chipping away at them someone who grows up in an environment with no love or no nurture so is it that one incident the car crash or equally a combination of over yeah. and over again and it's harder to pinpoint when you don't know where it's come from yeah you know if it's happened as a result of being in the car crash um, and that's, you know, obviously mm -hmm. tragic, but equally the person who comes home and is beaten up every night, uh, mm -hmm. subtly or passive aggressive, their confidence eroded by someone continuously, um, eroding at them, or maybe they were abandoned in the first few years. You look at the work of Bowlby, um, the famous psychiatrist who's talked about, you know, abandonment, 
and, and his theories. So that's why I find, in my opinion, the controversy comes in because equally there's, a, you, there's many people out there, they're not aware of it, mm. but they do possibly need that clinical help to yeah. go see the GP because they're not so they can't pinpoint where it's coming from. Yeah. But equally, you know, because it's happened over such a long period of time, these sort of incidents that you sort of think back, well, that probably wouldn't have caused it. Mm. But equally over, you know, a period of time it could do so. You know, the point being, you know, getting back to the, the stress management, for me, yeah, I think it's really important because if we can manage our stress, we do better in the exam. We do better in the presentation. We're more sociable. Yeah. Um, we're more ourselves. You know what it's like when you're really stressed and someone's looking to have a conversation with you. You know, it's not as easy. So the quality of our life is a lot better. We can manage our stress yeah. in one respect. You know, we can do better in the exam as well. So for me, it's a massive area and it really is important because the more we can manage our stress response, the better place we'll be. But to the point where we need it, it's crucial for our survival yeah. um, because we've got to know when to run, fight, flight or freeze. But equally, we don't really want to be in that state for long we need to be in that state. And I think for me, doing work on ourselves so when something does happen, we're better placed to deal with it. And as and when, if it does happen, because things will happen, mm -hmm. um, we're able to deal with things life in better. And that's not substituting from people going to get clinical help if they need that. Um, but equally, what I'm suggesting is the like analogy around eating well. You don't eat one good meal, your nutrition, you don't do one exercise in the gym and you're fit for life. You've got to sort of keep doing yeah, it. So for me, you've got to keep doing it. Yeah, like, meditating, yeah. Yeah. You know, doing whatever works for you, whether it's EFT, whether it's, you know, um, that, whatever works for the person, whatever they yeah. feel, whether it's breathing techniques, whatever works for them. If they find something that works for them really, really well, then it's about sort of um, practicing that. For me, it's mindfulness. Mm -hmm. I, I do. Um, probably six, seven days a week, half an hour of mindfulness. I studied it at level seven. Uh, and I'm continuing to study it now. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm studying the module on it. I've also looked at, you know, Buddhism as well and, and sort of done my own research as well. And you've probably seen a lot of artists like right in the area. For me, it really helps me a lot. Uh, but that not, might not work for other people. And that's the sort of whole thing for me that I sort of say to people, fine works for you. Yeah. And I think that brings us beautifully to sort of why we're, we're having this chat today, really, because um, Jimmy is going to be joining me. Um, so if you want to get some absolutely fantastic tips on uh, mindfulness, hypnosis, meditation techniques, Jimmy's going to be there. So you're going to actually absolutely. get to meet him, do, do the techniques. You're also going to be able to experience EFT, which is emotional freedom technique. And you're also going to uh, be able to experience uh, details about emotional eating. And uh, we've got our psychologist there who's got so much information. She's going to bring uh, her version of, of, of what is working best with her clients at the moment. She's going to give you all the taster of that. So you're going to be able to have so many techniques for you all to take away with on the day uh, and the reason that we've all decided to come together is because the nhs is under so much strain we we realize that there is so much stress out there that there are other ways there are other ways now for people to be able to tap into and uh, find out about what it is but at the moment some people only know these as, as words and a few little absolutely uh, videos here and there so we, we yeah. wanted to bring together uh four of us for the day to give you all a really interactive experience um of, of what alternative therapy is so yeah. jimmy's going to be there that's a, that's a great point i'm really looking forward to it and just to add to the eft um just the other day uh, when i sort of parked my car up i was ready to do the radio show that i do the radio broadcasting mm. show i was safely parked and, and the engine was off and if people noticed me doing tapping away <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't do mindfulness I didn't have the time to close my eyes and it probably wasn't a good idea to close my eyes and put the seat back um, in a car park uh, but equally I'd been cut up on the road and one of my guests had cancelled and um, all things was happening from every angle yeah. and I was about to do a, a broadcast to many thousands of people so I thought what I'll do is you know, so some things are more practical in certain situations than others. And, they are. And you've got to find what's right, right for you. Yeah. And I, and, I, and I felt so much calmer afterwards too, by the way. And I'm excited. I'm looking forward to working with you and, 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 and Jane and Julie. And, and, and this fantastic event. 
I'm really excited. It's great to be in Barrie. You know, I, I love the area. As you all know, I worked at the football club for many years there and um, I'm really excited. Really am. Thank Wonderful. You. Well, we're Thanks really looking forward to seeing you yeah. there and thank you very much yeah. and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care, folks. Thank you, Rachel. Take care. Bye. Bye.